Great. Well, thank you guys so much. For being here. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you guys about some of this work. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I want to talk to you about so a question that's been nagging me for a little while, um, which is to try to understand the role that geometry, and in particular, complex geometry and complex curves play in Kavanaugh homology. And so uh, the approach I want to take today is just to talk about a few different results uh, that sort of are themselves implicitly topological, but then try to pull back the, you know, the curtain a little bit and see what the geometry lying underneath it is. So, um, okay, great. So, well, let me see. Oh, actually, actually, you know, before we do that, let me just point out. So, right here on the uh, on the title screen, two things I want to point out. Some of this is joint work with my excellent undergrad student Alan Dew, uh, and also with a colleague Isaac Sundberg. And what I'm trying to represent here on the very first page is on the left we have this kind of depiction of a piece of a complex curve, so that just the real part of some polynomial, the zero looks some polynomial, two variables. Uh, but if we try to, instead of looking at the entire curve at once, just focus on, in this case, sort of its edge, which is the going to be the set of points that are of a unit distance from the origin, turns out for this particular curve, we're going to get a trefoil. And so this is a synopsis in the, in the sort of third little picture. And uh, so the question is sort of, when you take this process, this process of looking at complex curves through the knots that arise as sort of cross sections of them, uh, what happens when you shift to try and look at the role that Kavanaugh homology plays? And so uh, this last little image is a picture of a typical generator for Kavanaugh homology. And so uh, the, the big question I want to ask today is, what exactly does Kavanaugh homology measure topologically and geometrically? And for some bigger context, uh, the, part of the point is that you know part, a major uh, advance for our understanding of four manifolds, in particular three-dimensional and four-dimensional manifolds, since the beginning of the '80s, was to use gauge theory and floor theory and different tools that are deeply intertwined with geometry, uh, involve associating different types of spaces to some manifolds, some auxiliary spaces, and then studying you know homomorphic curves inside of there or other types of you know equations on connections, etc. Kavanaugh homology, on the other hand, is fundamentally combinatorial and rooted in sort of representation theory and uh, you know, ideas that are kind of removed from those geometric tools. And so two questions in particular I want to talk about are, you know, what does Kavanaugh homology know about smooth versus continuous topology? Many of the big questions in four-manifold topology involve understanding the difference between uh, the smooth category and the topological category. And then as a sort of a side question that I'm going to try to make a case is actually part of that same question. What does it know about geometry? So in particular, what does it know about complex curves? It's going to be one of our other questions. But right off the bat, we have a little bit of a, a limitation that I want to acknowledge, which is you know, a lot of the tools from gauge theory and floor theory, Hagar floor theory, et cetera, a lot of these come with a full suite of tools for studying three manifolds, four manifolds, objects inside of them, knots and links, geometric structures on those things. They're very sort of very complete sets of tools. Kavanaugh homology, at least in its current stage of development, uh, is really for knots and links in three-dimensional manifolds and also surfaces in, or I should say, sorry, in not just three manifolds, specifically in R3 or S3, with some extensions to some other simple three manifolds. Uh, but it don't, and also it surfaces in certain four dimensional spaces, but it doesn't have the sort of complete suite of tools that we have on the other side. And so I want to focus on sort of comparing these two theories, those two types of theories, in the setting where they both apply. So, what's the common ground? Uh, one of the sort of best places we can look for common ground to compare these different sets of tools is surfaces in four dimensional space, and in particular, I want to think of the role that complex curves play. All right. So I want to start off with sort of what the, the topological takeaways I want to leave you with are today. And then after we talk about the topological results, we'll dig more into sort of what's going on underneath with 
the geometry and the underlying theory. So the first takeaway I mean, you have is that quantum homology can distinguish some like, very subtly different surfaces in four-dimensional space. So one of the pairs of examples we'll be looking at are this pair of disks, and they're drawn here as uh, disks that are intersecting themselves, drawn in three-dimensional space. For example, you can see through this blue band type region crashes through these two sheets here, uh, and vice versa for this. But we can get a, an embedded surface in four-dimensional space by sort of dropping pieces of the surface down below to avoid the intersection, kind of like having an underpass so that two roads don't intersect. Uh, so we'll talk more about that in a, in a bit. But it turns out that these surfaces are topologically equivalent in the sense that they differ by some ambient homeomorphism, but they're not smoothly equivalent. You can't relate them using some ambient diffeomorphism or smooth isotopy. However, it's not a perfect tool. Quantum homology uh, can also fail to distinguish some surfaces that are different if they're subtly different. So another set of examples we'll look at are these surfaces originally uh, studied by uh, Bob Gomp. And it turns out this gives some infinite family of surfaces and they are distinct, yet they all induce the same map on quantum homology, which is the way we study uh, surfaces using quantum homology. And then the final type of idea I want to emphasize is that when you look at complex curves in particular, which you can do in quantum homology using braids, uh, you get special properties. The, the invariants have certain extra constraints. And so uh, this is sort of a cartoon of a, a braid and what's called a braided surface. And these braided surfaces provide a nice framework for thinking about complex curves. So these are the three big takeaways that I'll say something more specific about as we go through. Okay, so just sort of first obligatory, you know, quick review. Uh, I'm not going to sort of actually define quantum homology, but just want to remind you of the, the feel of what's going on and why it's fundamentally different than a lot of more geometric theories. So what, what is it at its core? It's going to take a knot or a link in three-dimensional space, and it's going to assign some bi-graded Z module to it. So if I have some link, here it's a trefoil, then I'll get some Z module, just if you think of this as a group. And it's going to be bi-graded. So it's going to split into a bunch of these subspaces, KH, HQ, where these are the two different bi-gradings, the homological grading and the quantum grading. The details won't really matter that much. OK. And just to get, remind you a feel for what's going on here, it's very diagrammatic and combinatorial. You take your knot diagram, and you try to think of all different ways of smoothing out the crossings. Here we have three crossings, so we end up with two to the three different ways of smoothing it out. And then we take those smoothings, and we consider all the ways of labeling them with elements of some simple algebra. And that gives you sort of an explosion of a bunch of more generators. And then these generators are organized into some you know, high dimensional cube with some maps between them defined by uh, sort of the rules for resolve changing the, the resolutions of the crossings. So you know, nowhere in here are you counting some you know, modulized space or measuring some modulized spaces of pseudo-homorphic curves or any type of anything like this. This fundamentally combinatorial approach. So what has, you know, what we're talking about here is really an invariant of knots and links, but it does contain some four-dimensional data. So what has it told us so far in four dimensions? Well, most of the applications so far of quantum homology in dimension four involve uh, something known as Rasmussen's invariant. So this is some even integer which you can associate to a knot, and you can extract it from the quantum homology uh, package as a whole. Part of why it's so useful is that it provides us with a slice genus bound. So half the magnitude of this invariant is a lower bound for the smallest possible genus that some not uh, of a surface that some not bounds in the four ball. So it provides a lower bound on the complexity of surfaces in the four ball based on their boundary. And it's a really powerful uh, tool. So what are some of the applications in particular of this? Well, one of the most sort of, uh, you know, there's, I'll mention a few things that have been reproven using this, but one of the sort of spectacular uh, original results using this tool that can't really be reproduced in the case theory side yet 
is that the Kame knot is not slice. So uh, at least we can reload through this in 2018. And so this says that this particular knot, this Kame knot, does not bound a smoothly embedded disk in the uh, four dimensional ball. There's also some really celebrated uh, reproofs of earlier results. So Rasmussen gave a combinatorial reproof of the Milner conjecture, which concerns the, the slice genus or the knotting number of uh, torus knots. And also, Rasmussen gave a reproof of the existence of exotic smooth structures on four dimensional space using this invariant. And the final thing I want to mention in terms of applications of Rasmussen invariant is due to Peter Lambert Cole, who reproved what's known as the adjunction inequality in symplectic four manifolds. And the idea here is that a lot of the work is being done by contact geometry and theory of trisections, but at the end of the day, the underlying tool that actually gives you the core obstruction uh, is Rasmussen invariant. Okay. So the question is, you know, this diagrammatically defined uh, combinatorially you know, constructed invariant is somehow seeing something about four-dimensional properties, uh, four-dimensional topological properties. And so the question is like, what's at the heart of that, that detection, that, that sense of the uh, four-dimensional results? And the answer is link cobordisms, okay? So commodity homology, it doesn't just assign a group to a link, it assigns a homomorphism between groups to surfaces, mutos cobordisms between links. Okay, so here we have some genus one-ish uh, cobordism between a trefoil and unknot. And so what we get is some homomorphism between the homology of the trefoil and the unknot. All right. So maybe a little less cartoonishly, here we have a schematic. We have some, some link L0, some link L1. And we have some surface interpolating between them in S3 cross an interval. And so what we're going to get is some homomorphism from the cohomology of L0 to the cohomology of L1. Now, part of what actually powers the results in the previous applications, we we're talking about ones from Rasmussen variant, is that the, the effect of these maps on the bigrading picks up the complexity of the surface in terms of its Euler characteristic. So there's a grading shift, which is that the quantum grading is shifted by the Euler characteristic of the surface. And so you can imagine this is sort of how at its core you're getting constraints from the complexity of surfaces uh, from Rasmussen variant, because it's measuring the, the grading shift of the cohorts and maps is measuring the Euler characteristic. Uh, and so not only do these maps exist, but it turns out that they're also, they're also invariants, at least in a suitable sense. So uh, the maps associated with some surface are invariant up to sign uh, under smooth isotopy of the surface, fixing the ends. So if you, as long as you hold the ends in place, you can wiggle around the interior of the surface and you get the same map, at least up to sign. Now, as I mentioned, there are uh, sort of modifications of the original theory where you can get rid of this, this sign ambiguity. But for our purposes today, we will only need the sort of original simple version. Okay. So, and by the way, I meant to mention before, um, please do just you know, unmute and interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, I won't see the chat, but all right. So, so what do we do with this? We have this package which assigns groups to knots and links and assigns homomorphisms to surfaces between them. And we're seeing that, in fact, the actual homomorphisms are invariants. And so the question becomes, how useful are those invariants? So in particular, can these, these homomorphisms distinguish inequivalent surfaces? And so just sort of to start to warm up to the idea of surfaces in four dimensional space, you know, it's been known since, uh, you know, not too long into the 20th century that there are ways of putting surfaces inside a four-dimensional space that are knotted in the same way that you can put loops inside a three-dimensional space in a way that are knotted. And so here, sort of a cartoonishly, what we have is sort of a, a regular old sphere on the left. And then we're imagining on the right that if you're allowed to use the fourth dimension, 
you can take each one of those great circles of the sphere or the half of those great circles and use the extra wiggle room of the extra dimension to actually tie in a knot to the great circles. You couldn't do this in three dimensions because those great circles would get tangled up inside of each other, right? You can do it to one and then it starts getting tangled up to one's next to it. But in four dimensions, you have enough room to do this. And this is a classic way of producing interestingly uh, distinctly embedded surfaces in four dimensional space. And so you can ask, you know, can cohomology, can the homomorphisms that you get for surfaces like this distinguish the surfaces? And the answer is no, uh, at least if the surface is closed, like in this case of spheres. So Rasmus and Tanaka following, you know, after work of, uh, I believe Carter and Sato and believe somebody else, but I'm blanking in the moment, who had sort of found some initial evidence that these maps could not be very interesting, proved that in general, if their surfaces don't have boundary, in which case they're going from the quantum homology of empty set to itself, so from Z to Z. Uh, in this situation, the maps can't distinguish the surfaces. In fact, they're just determined by the Euler characteristic, well, of each connected component. Okay. However, uh, you know, all is not lost. Last year, early last year, uh, Isaac Sundberg and Jonas Swan proved that if you allow boundary, so if you look at properly embedded surfaces in the four ball with boundary in the three sphere, now you actually can use these homomorphisms to distinguish different surfaces and particularly you can use them to distinguish different disks. So we'll discuss some results like this. But the, the upshot here is to say that Indeed, the actual homomorphism, the actual invariance, the, key, the TQFT structure of quantum homology does provide a useful invariant of the surfaces. It's not simply that the surfaces, you know, uh, induce some map, which is useful for things like Rasmus invariant. The actual homomorphisms themselves contain uh, information about the embedding of the surface and not just its complexity. Okay. So knowing that these surfaces are, or sorry, that these invariants of surfaces do you actually contain some information besides the some information about the embedding? We can go back to one of the questions from the very beginning, which is what differences between smooth and topological four manifold theory can be seen by quantum homology? So all of the surfaces that were distinguished by Sunberg and Swan were also known to be distinct using basic algebraic topological tools, in particular the fundamental group of their complement. So what if uh, we want to ask, can, can quantum homology actually tell us something new about exotic phenomena, differences between smooth and topological phenomena? And so there's a relevant definition here, which is that we say two surfaces are exotically knotted if they're isotopic through ambient homeomorphisms, but not ambient diffeomorphisms. That is, they look the same if all you care about is continuous topology, if that's your perspective, but if you care about differential topology, they're different. So these are known as exotically knotted surfaces. Okay, so the, the first result I want to mention uh, proved to Isaac Sundberg last year, which is that indeed, cohomology can distinguish exotically knotted surfaces. And here's a, a core example we'll look at a little bit here. So these are back to these two surfaces we showed at the very beginning. And the idea is that there's some fixed knot, I'll call it J, in S3, and it bounds these two different surfaces in D and D prime in the four ball. And now you might notice there's sort of an, an obvious involution, one disk is obtained from the other by just applying this symmetry of J. And the point is that the symmetry of J that rota rotates it by 180 degrees along the Y axis, that doesn't extend to the disks. So the disks end up being different. I should, what I should say is it doesn't extend over each disk. Uh, so the, the disks end up being different. And so what the, what the claim is here is that D and D prime induce maps on quantum homology from J to the empty set, uh, which are distinct. And so these surfaces are not smoothly isotopic if you hold the boundary still. But it turns out that they are topologically isotopic. And you can prove that using uh, some work of Kamei and Powell that builds on Friedman's celebrated uh, disk and theorem work. So um, let's see, what do I want to say next? 
Yeah. So I want to I want to give it a separate perspective of this. And actually, maybe just drop back for one moment. We said before that you can represent these embedded surfaces in four dimensional space, just in three dimensional space by allowing certain types of self intersections. Alternatively, we can think about viewing the disk as being sort of three D printed in over time. So, on the left, we have a cartoon. We're going to describe this disk as uh, a disk with one index one critical point and two minima, so one saddle and two minima. And so the boundary of this disk is the knot we saw. And then as you descend down into the four ball, into time, what you see is that the disk starts to come close together, and then it pinches at a point, and then it goes the other way. So we're seeing a saddle here. And then there's just isotopy, so the level sets of this just sort of move around in space. And then we see one local minimum and a second local minimum. So we're sort of watching a movie of our disk here in time. And so maybe I'll pause for a second to see if there are any questions or anything so far before I say what we're going to do with this movie. Okay. So part of the reason why I want to give this alternative picture of this uh, of this disk is because this is how Kavanaugh homology thinks of the, of the disk. Because the, the theory is defined by associating these complexes to knot diagrams, the core way that you, that you associate homomorphisms to surfaces is by carving the surface up into a sequence of diagrams with certain sort of well-defined elementary moves occurring at things like saddles, and then also maps associated to things like Reitermeister moves, these moves that let us simplify the number of crossings in the diagram all the way down uh, to these unknots, which we then cap off with local minimum, minima. And so what does it mean to distinguish these surfaces using Kavanaugh homology? What we need to do is find some elements in the Kavanaugh homology of the knot, which map to one place under one map and something else under another map. And the point is, our our domain is the quantum homology of this knot J, and our target is the quantum homology empty set, which is just the integers. So what we cook up is, and I'll mention later how we get there, for now I'm just going to sort of act like it's a rabbit pulled from a hat. What we just find is some element of quantum homology, which it maps to one under one of the disks. And so it's sort of small because I'm not sort of expecting to internalize any of this on the fly, but the point is on the top of these two, uh, bigger rows, we have the underlying diagrams from the movie. And then below, we're tracing along some element in the quantum homology of the knot and watching what happens under the elementary homomorphisms associated to the different steps of the movie. And it turns out that if you go through the calculation, uh, which this, this, I mean, it looks kind of weird, but this literally is the calculation, uh, this element maps to one. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the other disk, D prime, so this was for the, this was for the, the map associated to D, and we looked at this element phi, phi in the quantum homology. If you instead look at D prime, the first step in this movie, the movie for this disk, is a saddle on the other side. So for D, we had a saddle on this side. For D prime, we have a saddle on this side. And it, it turns out, just because of the rules for the elementary homomorphisms, that when you split using this saddle, it has the effect of immediately killing this element. Now, for anyone who's more familiar with quantum homology, what's going on here is that that saddle has the effect of merging two circles that are labeled with an X, and the associated homomorphism maps that those to the product, X and X go to X squared, but in this algebra used to define quantum homology, X squared is zero. So you end up sort of by design killing this element. Okay. And you know, the point is not to say, OK, now you should be convinced of this calculation and why it makes sense. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of illustrate again the fact that this is not plugging in some clever geometry uh, of observations. This is really using uh, just the, let me see if I can move this uh, screen controls. Second, so I'm high floating, great. OK, so the point is that this is really following along this topological movie with just some kind of combinatorial guess. And I'll explain how we got that guess uh, in a bit. 
but I'll pause just in case there are any sort of general questions about the, the, the core philosophy of distinguishing, the, distinguishing these by plugging in some elements of cohomology and just checking where they go. Okay. All right, so, so that's the first result I wanted to mention. And I'll tie it back into complex curves in a bit, but uh, a couple other quick remarks on, on this type of result. So I just showed an example for disks, but in fact, you can do this with any type of surface, any type of genus, orientable or not, connected components, as long as you have at least one boundary component. For context, exotic surfaces are usually distinguished by instead taking some gauge or floor theoretic tool and associating it and, and studying it on some associated four manifold. So you do something with the surface, like remove it from the four ball or take a branch cover over it and then apply some gauge theory, you know, something like this. So this is a fundamentally different approach. It's directly applying the TQFT structure of quantum homology. And for, comp for comparison, not floor homology, or at least a, a, a perturbation of it, a twisted version, can detect what's known as rim surgery on surfaces. And so this is another way to get exotically knotted surfaces in the four ball. Uh, and this is due to Johannes Miller and Zemke in 2020. And part of the reason I mentioned this is because my, uh, my guess would be that the maps on quantum homology will not detect this kind of change, whereas the maps on this sort of twisted version of, of not floor homology do. And in fact, this extra bit of data that they're able to, to track by changing, by changing not floor homology is really essential. Indeed, the underlying maps on just regular not floor homology do not detect this change to a surface. So part of the idea is that one of the other differences between quantum homology and some of these other theories is that these other theories, at least at the current stage of development, oops, are more amenable to these extra modifications that pick up additional data. Okay. So now let's start bringing complex curves into the fold. The, the strange coincidence is that quantum homology seems more sensitive to surfaces that arise from complex curves in the sense that they're given by intersecting the four ball with some larger complex curve in C2. Maybe it's the zero set of your favorite polynomial in two variables. So that's true of these core set of examples. Uh, and it's also true for infinitely many other different pairs that you can distinguish using quantum homology. So here's another set of disks that also turn out to be distinguished by quantum homology and also arise as pieces of complex curves. So the question is why is there sort of this preferred behavior um, and I should point out these latter pair of disks, you actually don't really need quantum homology to distinguish them. It turns out that algebraic topology can distinguish them as well. Uh, but the approach to distinguishing using quantum homology is very similar to the ones where algebraic topology cannot distinguish them. Okay, so to try to drive at the difference here with the relationship with complex curves, let's look at a pair of disks that don't come from a complex curve. So on the left, we have this famous slice disk, it's the simplest slice disk, uh, or simplest interesting slice disk, I should say, uh, which is bounded by the knot uh, known as the stevedore knot. And so we're drawing it here as the self-intersecting disk in three space. Its boundary is the stevedore knot. And the stevedore knot has this other diagram, which has this rotational symmetry. And so if you take this disk and apply this symmetry to it, which is sort of hidden somewhere in this diagram, even though we can't see the symmetry, you apply this symmetry to the boundary, you get some second disk. And it turns out that, that those disks are distinguished by quantum homology. But it, the result looks fundamentally different than the case for the disks that came from complex curves. In particular, these disks, if you only look at uh, Z2 coefficients instead of Z, then the disks are not distinct. So somehow the difference between this is not as robustly picked up by quantum homology. It, you have to look over Z coefficients uh, they're not distinct over Z mod two coefficients, unlike the other examples. So continuing in that vein of sort of where the detection starts to break down, uh, Alan Du and I proved that there's infinitely many surfaces in B4 that are not smoothly as topic, yet they do induce the same map and they have the same boundary. So these are these examples due to Gomp. And 
the I'll say a word about what's going on here diagrammatically because I think that these these surfaces are just fun and very beautiful. So the colors here mean something slightly different than in previous examples. Here we have sort of two main sheets, a blue sheet and a pink sheet. And there are some bands that join those sheets. And so since the bands interpolate between the two sheets, the color on the bands sort of turns, interpolates between the colors of the sheets. But what's actually happening in this zone, these boxes represent additional crossings that vary with n. And what's going on is that you sort of take these two sheets before you have this band, you take these two sheets and you roll them up a bunch of times, however many times you want. And then you pierce the entire roll with this band. And the kind of remarkable thing is that there's really no reason you would think that this should be keeping your knot the same. This is a pretty like dramatic change to the diagram. But Gonf points out this beautiful little clever trick, which is actually there's an isotopy which drags these pairs of crossings through the entire diagram and around, and it sort of flips them across this class and then cancels them. And the idea is that this isotopy from one boundary to the next doesn't extend over the surfaces. This band here essentially gets in the way. Okay. So it turns out that these induce the same map of homology. Um, so Gomp distinguishes using cyber theory in the branch cover. Uh, and it is conjectured that these are topologically the same, just not smooth, but, uh, but not smoothly. And it is known that the fundamental group is not sufficient to distinguish them. They all have the same fundamental group. And in particular, it's Z, so you can't even really look at maps in to it in an interesting way. So a couple more comments on this example. Um, so an educated guess, we ha I haven't done the calculations. My guess would be that these surfaces are not distinguished by the maps on not floor homology uh, without doing a perturbation. However, I do think that if you, pick, you add in this extra data that you can track, just like in the U-House Miller's empty examples, that you would be able to distinguish them. And this is all part of pointing to trying to measure what types of modifications are picked up by these theories? What are these theories measuring? And so continuing with that sort of the foreshadowing of the you know, transition for the rest of the talk into talking about complex curves, the very first surface in this family, sigma zero, it turns out that it also arises from a complex curve. However, uh, it's expected that the higher, the higher index elements of the family are not pieces of a complex curve. And that's part of what's going on with their special behavior. You know, they're only seen if you can, or they're only distinguished from the first if you can check some, track some extra data. Okay. okay. So why the connection with complex curves? What's, what's actually going on underneath here? And to answer this, I like to think about it in terms of asking, well, like, what does a complex curve even look like? Because we need to ask, what does Kavanaugh homology see when you give it a complex curve? And so what does it look like to a not theorist? And so let's look at a particular example. Here's some complex curve. It's actually gonna be singular, but that'll be okay. What does Kavanaugh homology do? It wants you to look at slicing up that surface into a bunch of one-dimensional objects. And it turns out if you intersect this complex curve with a round sphere, no matter what the radius is, as long as it's positive, you'll just get a trefoil. So what's going on here is actually, topologically speaking, this surface, it looks like an infinite cone on the trefoil. So here's sort of a cartoonish version, and here's the version where we actually just take the real part uh, and project down into three dimensions. Oh, sorry, we take the projection, project out the imaginary part, basically. Okay, so let's do just a little bit of a wiggle to go from having a singular surface to having a smooth surface. We can say a bit more. So if we perturb our equation a tiny bit, we'll get a smooth surface. So here I'm just going to subtract epsilon off of the z coordinate. And what's going to happen is we're going to get some uh, non-compact genus one surface that runs off to infinity. Okay. And now if we ask what happens during the movie of this, we have small radius and eventually hit the surface. We have some minimum and then it grows. And then what we'll end up seeing is some ice copy and then a saddle and then a second saddle and then we'll get the trefoil again. And this makes sense because when you take just a small perturbation, this minus epsilon, that doesn't change the behavior at a large scales. 
So that's, that's why we end up with the same, not an infinity sort of, but we get this nice movie. And now the, the fact that you might notice something else here, which is that not only is this sort of a movie, just of some knots and links, these turn out to be braids. So it, there's almost sort of not enough data to fully appreciate it here. So I'll give a, uh, another description in a moment. But these diagrams can naturally be oriented so that they, all, they consistently travel counterclockwise around some central point. And it's this connection between complex curves and braids that is actually what lets us plug in quantum homology to the story. So the, the useful theorem here uh, is a result from a few years ago, which says, and now in general, if I have any smooth complex curve, and I start looking at increasing cross sections of it, intersections with constant radius spheres, then you can take your cross sections and represent them by braids, where the braids are related by certain, as you increase the radius, three core moves. So you can either add a new strand to the braid, which corresponds to a local minimum, you can add a positive generator to the braid, which corresponds to a saddle. Or you can do what's called braid isotopy and positive braid stabilization and destabilization. So here's corresponding to move one, a local minimum, where you just add a strand to the braid. Two, you can have a positively braided saddle. Or three, you can either do those simultaneously, which is basically an isotopy across the braid axis, or it's reverse. So this gives us a way of sort of asking to a asking from a not theoretic point of perspective, what does a complex curve look like when you try to study it by looking at its its cross sections? And again, those cross sections, those are the only information that quantum homology is seeing. And I should mention, um, well, yeah, actually, I won't. I shouldn't mention. I'll go on. <laughs> All right. So what's the idea in this? The the, the core idea for this proof. The point is that the complex structure on a two-dimensional complex space induces what's known as a contact structure on the three-sphere. So that's what's drawn in this first picture on the left. So these are some planes that exist sort of at every point in three-dimensional space, and they're maximally non-integral. There's at no point can you find a surface which is tangent to uh, the plane, you know, at along the entire surface, even locally. Okay. So it's maximally non-integral. And if you take any algebraic curve or complex curve in C2 that's transverse to a sphere, to a round sphere, and if you intersect it with the sphere, then just by considering co-dimension, you get some knot or some link. You just get some cross-section of the complex curve. But it has a special connection to the contact structure, which is that the, the intersection is oriented and it's positively transverse to the planes of the contact structure. So here we're seeing this red curve as an example of a transverse knot or a link, one which is always transverse, never tangent to the planes of this uh, contact structure. And so the connection between those transverse links and braids is that if you take a braid, which is an oriented knot or link, which is positive transverse to just the pages of what's called the standard open book or equivalently just the half planes which emanate from the z-axis, those naturally, braids can naturally be written as transverse links because, uh, I mean, it's sort of a proof by picture here, but just visually the point is that the, the transverse, like the contact structure, planes, so the contact planes here uh, are always sort of tilting at least mildly in the upward direction. And that's what lets you to always be positively transverse to them if you were braided. So Bennett can prove that every braid can be realized as a transverse link. And conversely, every transverse link is isotopic through transverse links to a braid. So there's this nice connection between complex intersections of complex curves, cross, sorry, cross sections of complex curves, transverse links, and braids. And the idea is to sort of dig into that uh, that connection to prove the theorem in the previous page that actually relates what happens when you pass a critical point to what change in the braids do you see. Okay. All right, so with this in mind, 
I want to spend the last few minutes just going back to this core example and talking about how to try to uh, how to try to factor this in, how, how to use this perspective. So the connection is that in fact we can realize these surfaces D and D prime as what are called positively braided surfaces. Uh, and there's just like the story on the previous slide between braids and cross sections of complex curves. These surfaces, which are known as positively braided surfaces, directly themselves correspond to fragments of complex curves. So on the left down here, we have a braid representative of J in the sense that if you close up these strands, you get the knot you get is isotopic to J. And associated to this braid, there's a natural surface. So you might notice that this braid has five strands. And so you take five parallel sheets and then the crossings in this braid, they all arise as conjugates of positive generators. Right? So here's a positive generator. And then we have two opposing signed uh, crossings on each side. And in general, we're seeing all of these crossings form conjugates of positive generators. And so we can take those regions of conjugates of positive generators and turn them into bands that tie together these sheets. And these are exactly what are known as positively braided surfaces. So this is a theory pioneered by Lee Rudolph, and it finds, provides a really nice way to work with these surfaces that are actually isotopic pieces of complex curves. So, so the idea now is with, with all of these bits of insight, if you want to now try to figure out, well, how would you go about mining the information in quantum homology to try to distinguish these surfaces? How can you let the geometry try to inform the proof? So, so the question is, we look at the quantum homology of J, that's our domain. Where are we going to find some elements that behave differently under these surfaces? Um, so here's the quantum homology of J. It's this big, nasty mess. Uh, it's bi-graded, so we can, we can split up the quantum homology into all these different subspaces. And the first order of business is to remember that we said the maps in quantum homology are graded by the, uh, the sorry, the, the change in the quantum grading has to do with the Euler characteristic of the surface. So right away, just by knowing where our maps need to be supported, uh, we can say, well, the Euler characteristic of a disk is one. And that means if we want to map into the quantum homology of the empty set, which is supported in bigrading zero, zero, our domain or our, the support of our map is going to be in bigrading zero minus one. So the upshot is that that immediately singles out which small subspace we need to be looking at. So we only need to study elements that are in this particular bigrading here. And there's essentially, you know, two uh, linear independent directions to study in that bi-grading. So if we're searching for some elements of quantum homology that might have some topological geometric significance because we want to study their image under these maps, there's two perspectives. So the first is to try to use that picture from before, the role with contact geometry and complex geometry and braids and braid factorizations. And the point is that this almost works. So I'm going to I'm going to wax philosophical for one minute without sort of anything that's on the page. Uh, but this is where sort of the majority of the rest of the talk is going to be just a pitch that if we're trying to understand the geometric and topological content of quantum homology, I think that looking at braids and complex curves is a core piece of that story. So if you if you back up further. Quantum homology is a categorification of the Jones polynomial. The Jones polynomial, it's in, in its inception, is rooted in understanding braids, in particular certain representations from the braid group. Now, the categorification that quantum homology originally wrote down, yes, is entirely diagrammatic, but still does have buried inside of it these connections to braid uh, representations of braid groups. And in particular, there's a a floor theoretic construction of quantum homology, which based on some work of uh, Quantum and Seidel and then Seidel and Smith and eventually Abu Zayed and Seidel, bit by bit studies certain representations from the braid group or sorry, well, certain actions of the braid group on these spaces that arise in symplectic geometry. And by applying you know, 
uh, floor type construction to uh, within this this framework, you can recover Kavanaugh homology using floor theory. And so part of the idea is that you know we know embedded somewhere inside of the, even this diagrammatic picture of Kavanaugh homology, there's this underlying connection to braids. Now, more specifically, uh, Olga Planowska showed that Kavanaugh homology contains an invariant of braids. If you have a specific braid, it turns out that there's a distinguished class in Kavanaugh homology associated to that braid representation. And so we, what we tried to do was at first say, okay, well, we know that complex curves and braids are related. So let's study the, that specific element, Palmanesca's invariant of braids, under the map. And the problem is that, for the maybe not the problem, but the amazing fact is that for surfaces which come from complex curves, they always behave the same way on Palmanesca's invariant. So in fact, they Palmanesca's invariant can't distinguish between complex curves. However, if you tweak it, if you tweak Palmanesca's invariant and try to actually refine it to not just be a Sorry, if you try to refine it to not just be an invariant of the braid, but of the specific factorization of the braid into conjugates of positive, cross of positive generators, so let me just go back to this picture, Palinovskia gives you a way to associate an invariant to the braid as a whole. But what we, try, what we tried to do was instead get a refined invariant, which is an invariant of the factorization of the braid into conjugates of positive generators, because that's what actually determines the surface. And so the, the construction doesn't quite work. I mean, it almost works. And in some sense, what you can construct is an element which is a, a nice chain in cohomology, but it doesn't turn out to be a cycle. Yet it has exactly the properties that you want. If you just try to map that cycle, if you try to map that chain through uh, the two different disks, it distinguishes them. But that's not a proof that they're different because the chain maps are not invariants. So there should perhaps be some lift of Palmanesca's invariant two factorizations of quasi-positive braids that should work. Uh, but since we weren't able to make that technically work, you know, that's some room for future work. And so just to wrap up, I want to say what did work. So instead, we took Palmanesca's invariant, wrote it down in the, in the non-braided diagrams, and then tried to make it asymmetric. So we sort of leveraged the symmetries of the diagram instead, and exactly the the symmetry that we're looking at in the very first, one of the very first slides, which relates those disks, we wanted to make the cycle, the chain element, not symmetric under that action. So just to briefly explain the, uh, what that means, uh, with this last minute or so. So what we did is we started with a, an element of conformology, which appears to be Palmanevska's invariant. That's this, that's this element on the left. And as you can see, it's highly symmetric. It's exactly symmetric under this symmetry of J. And since that symmetry is what relates D and D prime, we don't really expect this element to distinguish them. It has the same symmetry uh, as the symmetry which relates those disks. So instead, we modified the cycle in a certain way, uh, which is informed by both the sort of topology of these disks and also just by the symmetry. So in particular, you'll note that just like here, you have these two sort of blobs, which are sh certain sheets of the disk. Those correspond to these two blobs, if that makes sense. And over here, you have this band and that corresponds to this region being connected versus it's flipped on the other side. And so I'm just sort of saying this in this informal way, but we're sort of blending some of the input from Palmanovsky's invariant with some of the information from the symmetry of the diagram and just trying to sort of guess and get lucky. And indeed, we did get these elements which distinguish the surfaces. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so we changed certain crossings, made certain different labelings to get elements which distinguish these. So, yeah, okay. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, happy to take any questions, but otherwise, thank you guys. So uh, are there any, any questions for, for Kyle? Okay. So 
I mean, could you just go back to that last diagram um, and just have another uh, one more time? Yeah, absolutely. What, what was happening there? Because it looked to me like you'd taken that symmetric class and you'd just redrawn it in a way that looks non-symmetric. And so I was... Yeah, so that, that, that's right. So the, the idea was, well, there's not sort of a, we don't regret to prove it or anything like that. If you try to take the construction that Pominevskia applies to braids to get some invariant, mm -hmm. and you try to write it down in a non-braided diagram in the best, in the way that's most sensible to follow her definition, you get this element. Okay. Uh, and so just to re re reiterate the point from before, the, the fundamental problem is that the symmetry which relates to D&D prime is already possessed by this. So mm -hmm. we don't really expect it to act differently. And so what we did was, we changed the resolutions of the crossings, uh, virtually all of the ones that are off the axis of symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that might not be quite literally true, but I think maybe with like the exception of one or two. And what was guiding the change was that we knew that A, we needed it to be asymmetric, and then B, we knew that if you did a, we wanted to somehow connect to the topology of the surface. And if, if you do a saddle move, uh, on a circle that's X labeled and it splits it, then it splits it into two X labeled circles, as opposed to if you do a saddle move that merges two X labeled circles, it kills the element. So we're, you know, I think it was sort of like after the fact or halfway through the fact, we suddenly realized that what works are these cycles that kind of look a little bit like the surface in some weird way. Um, you know, it would be nice to actually make that more than just a coincidence, figure out more of an algorithm. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's sort of half experimental kind of guess and check. Because I think the thing that confused me was sort of the two diagrams on the right are sort of planar isotopies of the thing on the on the left, but they're actually different resolutions. So they're living in different, different corners of the cube. So yes, that's okay, exactly okay. right. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, so like, for example, like, Where's a good example? Um, I guess it's kind of hard to see, but for example, like this crossing, this crossing right here has one resolution here, which is kind of like horizontal-ish. Over here, it's vertical-ish, yep. um, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. And I should mention, um, I had some backup stuff over here. Oh, is it not? Actually, I thought it was in here. Maybe it's not. Um, okay, I thought I had another picture. Uh, in parallel, we were also doing this with the braided picture and you can get some classes that actually what i'll say is you can do the whole refined plumeskism invariant in some ad hoc way when the braid is quite simple but it's not the the, the elements of cohomology you're writing down have multiple elements and when you start to try to do it with braids that are as complicated as this one where there's like 20 odd crossings you just get an explosion of the number of uh generators you're using to express your elements and it just gets out of hand computationally. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so my other question is perhaps a question just relating to my ignorance of, in ignorance of complex sort of geometry, but in your theorem, you said, you, you know, these surfaces you were constructing, you were adding only positive um, crossings. Uh -huh. So, I mean, my sort of understanding was that quasi-positive was the sort of links of complex curves. Should, you should also have quasi-positive stuff. Is this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. So, so the way you can think about it is um, because you're allowed to do the, these things and braid isotopy, what, uh -huh. the thing you should imagine happening is that you do like, let's say a braid isotopy, which creates like a Reitermeister 2 move or something, and that gives you positive and negative, and then you put a band somewhere. Okay, so yeah, okay, that, that answers, that answers, it was just my, okay. Yeah, no, but it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great point. And that, in that sense, I, I think that this is part of why, in some ways, quasi-positive braids are more natural than positive braids, because from the perspective of just, uh, what's, well, what's the right way to put it? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they are sort of, I guess at some kind of weird formal level, it's like the monoid generated by the positive crossings instead of just the, or normally generated by the positive crossings instead of just uh, 
literally only products of fossil crossings. Yeah, no, I can I can see that. Uh, thanks. Are there any are there any other any, any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank uh, thank Kyle again. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. Thank you.